Welcome. In this video, we'll take a look at section 5.5, working with some additional identities. And we'll start with working with some inverse trig functions um, within some um, problems where we're going to be using our double angle identities and our sum identities. So let's take a look at the first example. Um, we have a reminder here to not forget to draw a picture. So remember when we're going through these problems, especially with these kind of nested trig functions, it's always a good idea to draw a picture um, of what we're working with to walk us through. So let's consider the first example. We have the sine of 2 cosine inverse of 1 over square root of 5. So I'm going to consider drawing a picture. of this inner function, and I'll start with this cosine inverse function. And we know that this is going to output an angle for us, and so we're going to draw what that angle is going to look like. So we have our coordinate plane. Um, for this, we know that a cosine inverse um, is going to be positive in the first quadrant, so we'll use the top right or the first quadrant um, to work with this inverse trig function. So we have a angle theta that has a cosine of 1 and then the square root of 5 as our hypotenuse. So we can do a little bit of work here and if we want to call this theta that would be okay. Um, we could call that angle theta. We can represent the opposite side of this triangle using the Pythagorean theorem. We know that the square root of 5 quantity squared is equal to 1 squared plus, we'll call this the b side squared. So we'll have 5 is equal to 1 plus b squared. Or we can say we're running out of room a little bit here, but we have that 4 is going to be equal to b squared. And when we take the square root, uh, b will be equal to plus or minus 2. Now, again, the context of our problem determines if we're going to take the positive or the negative root. In this case, we're in the first quadrant, so this is clearly a positive 2 for this opposite side. So we have our diagram. Now we can work with our outer function. So let's rewrite this expression. The outer function says sine of 2 times this inverse function, which we now have identified as this angle theta. So this whole cosine inverse uh, portion, we can represent as just an angle theta that we've drawn in our coordinate plane. And now we're working on what is the sine of 2 times theta. So we need our double angle identity. So by definition, this double angle identity, I'll write it underneath here, is equal to 2 times the sine of theta times the cosine of theta. So we just have to go out and find both the sine and the cosine of theta, and then we will simplify that result. So let's consider what our sine of theta will be. The sine of theta is going to be opposite over hypotenuse. So that would be, for us, 2 over the square root of 5. And then the cosine will be the adjacent, so that's 1 over the square root of 5. And so when we simplify this result, we'll have 2 times 2 times 1, which is 4. And then we have the square root of 5 squared, which is also going to be just 5. So for this result, we can use just 4 over 5. So I'll just write it out here clearly. 
4 over 5 will be our solution for that problem. All right. So let's take a look at a second one. In the second example, we just have um, a inverse function in terms of x. So here we can expect, since this expression is in terms of x, our final result will also be in terms of x, because we're using that variable as one of the side ratios. So we can almost consider, if we have a sine inverse of x, that's really the sine inverse of x over 1. That might be helpful to write it in that fashion. So let's consider how we can rewrite this inner function first. Again, we're going to be rewriting the sine inverse of x. So we'll draw our coordinate. Again, the sine inverse, we'll assume here that the x is the, a positive value here in the first quadrant. So we'll have a sine some angle is equal to x over 1, so that would mean that our opposite side is x, our hypotenuse is 1. And again, we can call this value theta, that angle that's created. Um, one thing that we might want to do here is find that extra side. We don't necessarily have to, uh, depending on what we do in this problem, but it's a good practice for us to uh, find that extra side. So we'll call this the B side, and we'll try to find what that adjacent side is. So we know that 1 squared is equal to x squared plus b squared. And we're solving for b. So this would say 1, and we can subtract the x squared over to the other side, is equal to b squared. And then taking a square root of both sides, we'll find that again, b is going to be equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. And again, the context of our problem determines the sign here. And so here we're in the first quadrant again, so we're going to take the positive result. So that will be the square root of 1 minus x squared. All right, so we can... Now consider replacing our sine inverse function with this theta angle. So we have the cosine of 2 times theta now. And so now we need to think about what do we want to represent cosine 2 theta with. There's really two or three representations for cosine 2 theta. And uh, for this time, I think the sine function is going to be the um, smallest or most simple expression to work with here. So we can recall that the one of the representations for cosine 2 theta is going to be 1 minus 2 times the sine squared theta. We'll use that representation there. And so... Let's fill in the, the details that we need. We have 1 minus 2, and then sine of theta here is just going to be x divided by 1, or just x. And so here, we can just replace this sine inverse by x, and this will be squared. And so my result here is just going to be 1 minus 2 times x squared. So we're leaving this in terms of x because our original problem was in terms of x. And that's the completion of this double angle problem here. Let's take a look at another case where we're using inverse functions. In this example, we're solving the following sine of arc sine of 3 over 5 plus arc sine or arc tangent of 2. So this is a good reminder to us that this arc sine and this arc tangent are, again, just um, the inverse function for sine and tangent. So we can really replace this with the sine inverse 
and this as the tangent inverse. We call it the arc tangent or the arc sine or the arc cosine because it, um, it has an input of a side ratio and it outputs an angle. So remember that these output an angle. So let's consider um, creating um, just a sketch of these two angles. So I'm going to consider rewriting this, and I'm going to just call A, an angle A, this arc sine of 3 over 5, and I'll call the next one angle B equal to the arc sine, or arc tangent, excuse me, of 2. So remember that these are angles. And so let's draw these one by one. If I was to draw the A arc sine of 3 over 5, I'll have a triangle here in the first quadrant with a sine of 3 over 5. So that's opposite is the 3 and the hypotenuse is 5, making the adjacent side a 4. That's a 3, 4, 5 triangle, our Pythagorean triple. And then we can take a look at a second angle of interest, which is the arc tangent of 2. Again, since the tangent is positive, we're going to be in the first quadrant here with the tangent inverse. So this would tell us that we're going to have the opposite is 2, adjacent 1. So we have a tangent of 2 over 1. So again, we can think of that as 2 over 1 for that tangent. Um, in this case, we might want to figure out what the hypotenuse is. That might be important for us later on. So we can take a look at 1 squared plus 2 squared is equal to our hypotenuse squared. We'll call that c squared. So we have 1 plus 4, and then 5. And then taking our square root, we would have the square root of 5 is equal to c. And again, that hypotenuse is always going to be the positive root there when we take the square root. So we have the square root of 5 for that hypotenuse. So now that we have these two angles figured out, these arc sine and arc tangents as A and B, let's just set, um, put those angles in their position. So we'll rewrite this expression now as the sine of angle A plus angle B. So notice what we have here. This is really a sine um, sum of angles. So we're going to use our sum formula for the sine function. So if we recall the, the sine sum formula, we're going to write this as the following. The sine of the first angle, A, times the cosine of B, and then we'll do plus the cosine of A and the sine of B. All right, get that all in. So now let's uh, take a look at filling the details in for this. This is the sine of A. So our sine of A, we can find in our first diagram. I'll change the colors here. Sine of A is just going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. That's 3 over 4. Cosine of B, looking at the B, cosine is going to be 1 over 
3 to 5. And then we'll have plus the cosine of a. So the cosine of a is going to be 4 over 5. Again, that's the adjacent side and then hypotenuse again. And then finally, the sine of b, that will be the 2 opposite side over the hypotenuse, so 2 over square root 5. Oops, and I put something wrong there. Sine of a should be 3 over 5. There we go. Sine of a should be 3 over 5. That wasn't looking too big good. So I think we're looking fine right now. So let's consider uh, putting all this together. Um, looks like we're going to have a common denominator of 5 roots of 5. We have 3 times 1 is 3. 4 times 2 is going to be 8. So 8 and 3 give me 11. And then we can also simplify this by uh, the rationalizing of the denominator. So let's do that to have a complete solution here. We'll multiply by that root 5 over root 5 and see where our simplification brings us. So when we do this rationalization, we have 11 roots of 5, and then we'll have 5 times the root of 5 times the root of 5 again. That will just be 5 times 5, or 25. And there doesn't look to be any more simplification to do, so here we'll have 11 roots of 5 divided by 25 as our final solution. So that's looking good. So let's take a look at one more of this variety working with our inverse functions. So again, we have some inverse functions, a tangent inverse and a sine inverse. And so let's take a look at um, rewriting these with some diagrams. So I have the tangent inverse of 2. So that will be a similar picture to what we had before, where we have 2 to 1. And again, we'll call this angle A, and we'll call this angle B. So the tangent inverse of 2, that'll be the angle A. We know that is the square root of 5 again. And then we'll have a second diagram that matches up cosine of one half, or the sine of one half. So this is again in the first quadrant. We'll call this angle B. And for the sine of one half, we'll have opposite is one, hypotenuse is two. And we might need to go out and find that adjacent side. So we know that 2 squared is equal to 1 squared plus, we'll call this side the a side, assume. Solve for a. So we have 4, 1 plus a squared, or 3 is equal to a squared. And then we can take the square root of both sides to get plus or minus root 3 is equal to a. And again here, we'll take the positive root since we are in the first quadrant. So this will be root of 3. All right, now that we have our angles measured out here, um, our diagrams are set. Now we can turn our attention to the problem at large, looking at the outer function of the cosine of the first angle we called A. And then we notice we're subtracting, so we'll subtract angle B. So the overall problem here is looking at a difference of 
angles in a cosine function. So let's recall what we need to do for the cosine function. Whenever we were taking either a sum or a difference here, we always start with a cosine of both angles. And then here, since it's a minus sign in the cosine, we do a plus sign or change the sign to a plus, and then we do the sine of both angles. So we need to take the cosine and the sine of all of these angles here. So let's start with the cosine of A. Cosine of A will give us 1 as the adjacent, root 5 as the hypotenuse, so 1 over root 5. Cosine of B, cosine of B will give us the square root of 3 over 2. Plus the sine of A will give us 2 over the root of 5. And then finally, the sine of B will give us 1 over 2. So we'll simplify this up a little bit. We have the square root of 3 plus 2 times 1 is 2, and a common denominator of 2 roots of 5. And again, um, here we can uh, simplify by multiplying by our square root of 5 on both top and bottom to rationalize. So let's do that just for some practice here. So here we'll actually have to distribute this to two places. We'll have root of 3 and root of 5 give us the root of 15 plus 2 roots of 5 all over. We have 2 times the root of 5 times the root of 5. That's really just 2 times 5 here. And so that'll be a 10 in the new denominator. And it doesn't look like there's any more simplification to be had here. Uh, 15, 15 doesn't break down anymore, and 5 doesn't either in those square roots. So we'll leave this as the exact answer, and we can move on from that one. The last thing that we'll take a look at in this video is the product to sum formulas. So the product to sum formulas is uh, kind of a reverse of the sum to the products that we just worked with. Um, in this last question. Notice that we went from a difference or a sum and we turned it into a product of cosines and sines. Here we kind of do the opposite. So just another way we can uh, manipulate sines and cosines. There's four different representations with combinations of sines and cosines with two angles. So let's just work on um, rewriting um, these sum and differences or the products um, into sum and differences here. So we'll start with uh, part A. We have six times cosine of six X and then sine of two X. Now, uh, one thing we can look at here is we can name these angles inside 6x. We could say maybe that's angle A, sine of 2x, 2x we could call angle B, and we can see which one this really matches up with in terms of our product to sum. If I consider the list here, we really have a cosine of A and a sine of B. So here I'm going to be looking at this second representation, cosine of A, sine of B. And we do have a constant multiplier here in our own problem that's a 6. So I'm going to just leave this out, and then we will rewrite this middle portion 
as it's shown. So if we rewrite the equation on the right with our sine and cosine here, our a and b, we have the following. We'll have one half. I want to highlight this as well. Make sure we have this highlighted, the one half as well. We'll have the one half and then times the sine of a plus b. So our a plus b is 6x plus 2x. And then we'll have minus the sine of a minus b. So a minus b would be 6x is our a. And then minus b would be the 2x. And then we'll end that parenthesis and bracket. Okay, a couple things we can do to simplify this expression. We do have the 6. We can multiply with the 1 half. So this will become a 3 on the outside. And then we'll become sine of 6x and 2x become 8x. And then minus, we'll have sine of 6x minus 2x will become 4x. So this will be the, the final result. We can leave that 3 factored out there. So we have 3 times sine of 8x minus sine of 4x. Let's consider a second product to sum problem. Here we have 4 times the sine of 7x times sine of 4x. So really there's two sine functions here with two different angles. So we can consider this as a sine A, sine B problem. And it looks like that is represented right here, where we have a sine of A, sine of B. So we'll highlight this one and take a look at rewriting this. So the 4 on the outside, we can stay um, on the outside. And then we'll have a 1 half in our formula. Again, this is going to be what we're rewriting. So we'll first look to work with the cosine function as our equation tells us. So the cosine first of a minus b. So cosine of a is 7x and then minus 4x. Then we'll go for the minus sign next. This is minus cosine of a plus b. So a again is 7x and b is 4x. And we will end that bracket and then the parenthesis on the outside. So again, we're just filling in the A and the Bs um, with this formula, where A is 7x and the B angle is 4x. So again, there's a couple of simplifications we could make here. One, just distributing the 4. So we have 4 and 1 half give me 2. And then we'll have cosine 7x and 4x give us 3x. And then we'll subtract cosine of 7x plus 4x being 11x. And again, on this one, we can leave the 2 factored out. And this is simplified down. So I hope this is helpful working with these additional um, identities using inverse functions and now the sum and product functions here. Uh, thanks for watching the video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.